Roy Freed, he'll be our speaker today. Um, Roy and I know each other first from the Bulgarian community, my, my mother-in-law and he knew each other from a while back. And uh, he was the first to publish a paper on computer law in 1960. And he will be talking about um, from the origins of computer law in 1960 to the modern law of the mind. Thank you. My wife and I were very fortunate in, uh, thank you so very much for coming. I, I so appreciate this and I hope that uh, I can stimulate you to be uh, curious and uh, engage with me maybe at lunch with some discussion. I'm e eager to get critiques and, and comments and, and so I can learn. Um, as I started to say, my wife at age 72 uh, we're fortunate to have Fulbright fellowships in Bulgaria, of all places, and uh, by a very interesting series of coincidences. Uh, I'm writing my autobiography now, and uh, all these items are pouring out of me, and uh, I hope that uh, eventually, if it gets published, it will attract people. But in any case, here I am. And, um, I've been lured into uh, talking about my great fortune of uh, discovering computer law uh, in 1960 in the middle of my career. Um, previous to that time, um, I was a late bloomer and uh, I sadly got involved with litigation in large antitrust cases with massive files and uh, it was onerous both uh, psychologically and physically managing these papers without the uh, computer help that uh, eventually were, um, were created. But uh, I must say that I'm glad that they didn't develop those systems while I was active. And they might have lured me to stay in that field, which I didn't like, so I'm glad that they delayed that a bit. Well, I happen to have, by good fortune, a uh, an innate engineering aptitude. Uh, I didn't realize that until late in life, uh, but I happened uh, to take advantage of it as, as things went along in various fields in which I worked. And um, when um, I was down in Philadelphia, uh, really desperate, uh, working on antitrust cases, uh, suddenly uh, in 1959 actually, uh, computers were first commercialized and my engineering aptitude enabled me uh, immediately to grasp what the technology was all about. It seemed to bewilder other people, but I was very fortunate and uh, uh, immediately I could recognize not only what they were about, but also I started to think in my usual uh, sort of uh, uh, preventive way uh, about the possible legal implications of having computers used and available. And so uh, I was inspired promptly uh, to write an article called A Lawyer's Guide Through the Computer Maze. And uh, I was fortunate to find uh, uh, Paul Wolken, the editor of The uh, Practical Lawyer, a publication of the uh, Joint Committee on Continuing Professional Education of the American Bar Association and the American Law Institute in Philadelphia and he immediately embraced the article and uh, published it. I was fortunate I found him because there were no um, editors, law students primarily, of the traditional law journals and law reviews who ever would have touched it because it was so different from the traditional footnoted article, ponderous articles. And um, that was a, a great fortune, good fortune for me uh, Paul uh, not only published it, but gave me free 200 copies of reprints that I could distribute because I immediately got the idea that I would like to develop a private practice. And also, he on his own initiative decided that I would be general chairman of seven continuing education programs throughout the country. So it was a great boost to me. And I, um, I, was, I was able as a a real lawyer rather than a lawyer who had become, uh, came from an engineering background, uh, to realize the uh, intellectual legal implications of computers being available and uh, readily discovered that they were very similar to existing law issues because computers were simply used either in place of or, 
or uh, to supplement the human mind. So uh, I was uh, enjoyed that aspect, and I wrote countless articles. And the wonderful thing was that computer law turned out to be the magic carpet for my wife and myself, and enable us to travel throughout the world for me to be the guru and give lectures, and it was absolutely wonderful. Well, I enjoyed that from 1960 until uh, 1986 when I retired. If you can figure, if I retired in 1986, I'm about <laughs> quite much older than all of you combined. And, uh, but what I found fascinating was that uh, while I uh, was satisfied with computer law and, and uh, that what I really, really came to enjoy was my retirement. Computer law was my avenue to uh, deeper thinking in retirement. And uh, if you have questions about computer law, if it, if it uh, uh, triggers your mind, I'd be delighted to, to answer your questions. Uh, first, I should say I found implications in practically all fields of law. I wrote articles about the tax implications, about the intellectual property implications, and uh, tort implications as involving civil wrongs. And uh, I, I found them in, in all fields and uh, a natural um, development uh, from those fields. Um, in intellectual property, I would say that that obviously uh, evoked um, copyright. And uh, it was amazing how, uh, I'm bragging now, how I readily appreciated the technology, but other people just simply couldn't grasp it. And uh, when computer people devised the term program, that really threw people. In, in the, uh, there was an um, effort to patent uh, a, uh, a program, the first effort, and uh, it got to the Supreme Court, and Justice Douglas, who was a, a very bright and wonderful man, uh, wrote an opinion and said that uh, computer programs were not patentable, but that doesn't necessarily mean they never would be. He had no idea what he was talking about, and neither did the, the lawyers uh, who were handling the case, and they, they, they simply couldn't understand that a program is a process, and processes are, are patentable if they are practical and, and, uh, and deal with uh, with, especially with tangible things. People couldn't understand the tangibility, the physical, not the tangible, the physical nature of uh, electrochemical, electromagnetic pulse signals in computers. It was way beyond their imagination. And, and it remains so today, astonishingly. Well, I, uh, I wrote an article pointing out the, the uh, analogy between the technology of computers and um, and other types of technology. And I had, I had fun that way. I, I like to stand out. I have a strong ego. And uh, it enabled me to become a real person after struggling with that awful antitrust litigation. Well, what I, my message really is how a mind evolves. And, and my mind uh, evolved from uh, computers. It, it's fascinating, and I'm so thrilled. Computers have made me, uh, as a person, uh, first uh, by getting into computer law, and uh, I had to struggle there. I uh, became active with a committee uh, of the American Bar Association called the um, Electronic Data Retrieval Committee. And they were focused only on searching the vast law library. And at that time, uh, the technology available was primitive. It was the uh, electromagnetic punch card systems of IBM and Remington Rand. And uh, then a, uh, a young imaginative uh, law professor at the University of Pittsburgh uh, was able to wheedle $400,000 from the Ford Foundation to create a very modest uh, computer batch processing system to search uh, law cases. And uh, that was really the beginning. But it was so primitive and, and, uh, and frustrating at the time. And I was a pioneer in that group trying to talk about legal issues. And uh, it didn't resonate with them. I mean, at one point, I had talked about uh, legal issues in taxation, how to tax uh, 
uh, the, uh, how to treat for taxation purposes uh, the, the expenses for creating programs and how to deal with the income from the, their marketing. And um, I, I did that and then I suggested moving on to other topics and one of the members of the committee said, well, you already covered the legal issues. It was so naive. And, uh, but in any event, I struggled through that. Um, I had a really great time. There was an American Bar Association conference in New York, uh, probably in the early 80s. <laughs> and I wrote a, a mock trial for that. And we demonstrated that in New York, how to introduce computer records into evidence. Amazing, but in the beginning there was so such ignorance about the nature of, of computer records and 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 uh, suspicion that they couldn't be reliable. That in many cases lawyers failed to file cases, very valid cases, to recover money due because of the concern lest they not persuade the judge to accept them. It was bizarre. It, it, it's amazing how naive. Uh, so many minds, bright minds, can be. And uh, in that case, it was interesting. Uh, the, um, the chair of a, uh, the business law committee agreed to sponsor that uh, uh, presentation, that mock trial. And uh, I got a very interesting judge, federal court, district court judge in New York, to agree to preside at it. And the last minute, that chair withdrew to sponsorship. And the judge said, we're going on, and we did it, and it was beautiful. It was, we read the, uh, the text uh, because we didn't have time to prepare, but it worked fine. And eventually, I sold it to a global publisher and got m enough money to take the family on a trip to Europe. Um, but in any event, um, I, I did that very satisfactorily. In fact, my last legal work was for MIT. Uh, I had, um, as, as in computer law, uh, become especially known for drafting contracts to describe the technology uh, in relationships. Uh, for example, for MIT, uh, they uh, w wanted Wachovia um, Computer Services uh, to take over the management of the student loan program. And uh, Wachovia presented us with a standard form contract, so-called, and it was really bizarre, even though they were supposed to be knowledgeable, and that was their industry. And I, I redrafted it and presented mine, and they both readily accepted it. And the uh, bursar at MIT uh, would repeatedly call me and say how nice it was to have that agreement in her draw, because it was really a, uh, a system designed for how to maintain that relationship, and it, it worked well. So I left in a blaze of glory. And then uh, there he was, retired, and relieved of the responsibility to make a living. And that made my mind available. I mean, it's wonderful how having time to think and trying to think is so rewarding. I mean, it, it really revealed to me the fact that I had a, a very good mind. I mean, it, it, it's thrilling to, to know your mind uh, that way. And what it did was, it enabled me to start thinking about the human mind by drawing a broad analogy from computers. Uh, not long before that, neuroscientists had finally discovered that the um, human mind uh, has, consists of circuitry uh, and uh, that there are, are um, electrochemical pulse signals that represent facts and ideas that flow through that circuitry. And uh, that immediately enabled me to start drawing a very broad analogy with computers. I mean, the parallels are so compelling. And um, I'm thinking deeply about that. Uh, I, I realized that the ideal way to learn how the opaque mind operates is by drawing analogies from features in the transparent computers. It's amazing how that, that, uh, that inferential technique, with, along with introspection, is the ideal means for non-scientists to discover what their minds are really like. 
and um, it provides an ideal basis for comparison. And the, really, the, the trick in that comparison is to realize that the human mind is superior to computers by virtue of its creativity and free will. And uh, that it, it opens up such a universe of understanding, of self-understanding, of understanding how society works by interaction of minds. And it, it, it opens up the, uh, this very broad concept that the whole world is actually a so-called information processing system. It's haphazard, but it exists, it is. And, uh, and what, what I, I'm especially thrilled about is the fact that by knowing how the mind operates uh, as uh, such an animate, autonomous machine, uh, it, you learn some of the, the nature and source of some of the social problems that we have in society. Uh, for example, the human mind arrives as a partial blank slate. Some people say as a blank slate, but that's not true. It, it arrives with this wonderful uh, potential array of abilities uh, for a, a person eventually to become an adult, a, a well-functioning adult. Uh, but it lacks the knowledge for using those great skills. But evolution, and it's all it's so related to evolution, uh, Evolution arranged naturally that when each human mind arrives with its partial blank slate, it automatically, from birth, starts to receive input signals from the environment. But who is the environment? It's immediately the parents. And so by starting with the parents, it immediately starts to uh, embrace the uh, automatically there their cultural values, their patterns of life, their religion, their politics. And that continues throughout life as the environment expands from the parents. And um, the, uh, what I find further, that makes uh, each mind susceptible to ideologies, automatic and naturally. I mean, it's, it's inevitable. And I realized that the um, instinct to survive which exists uh, in order to protect the physical structure of our bodies, at the same time exists to protect our, our point of view or our ego or persona uh, equally and uh, against contradictions. And uh, the, uh, it does so by argumentation, uh, verbal argumentation, and also violence, and that creates social problems uh, in, in society. Well, I think that this functional perception of the human mind that I'm describing as a machine so parallel to computers uh, enables people to understand how their uh, social problems and personal problems arise and, and makes it, uh, if they're deep thinkers, and should enable them to realize that in order to protect themselves and overcome many of those problems, they should take advantage of their creativity and free will and gain an open mind that uh, engages in critical thinking. And I have the, the theory that that's an ideal basis for teaching, especially young people, how to start thinking, how to, to start using their minds constructively for their own benefit and for the benefit of society if they will think broadly enough. Well, this is the general context in which I've been thinking deeply, and I find it so amazingly exciting. I, I find having the opportunity to think deeply on your own is just the most precious experience that is, is imaginable. It, it, it's a, uh, an absolute delight. I, I, I can't tell you how much I find it uh, exciting and, uh, and, create and, and creative and, and, and supporting my ego. You know what I mean? It makes me an important person in my own estimation. And uh, but what I find fascinating is that knowing this general um, 
nature of the human mind I describe, uh, it's, it becomes possible to find aspects of it that are so interesting, to get away from the generality to the specific. For example, I came to realize uh, on my own, and I, I do all of this independently, I, I don't do research. I, I, I find, I can't find uh, parallel approaches uh, to my thinking, and also I'm selfish enough that I want to do it myself. I want it to be my, my creation. But in any event, by thinking independently, suddenly I find the amazing subconscious is so creative. It, 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 Freud's discovery of the unconscious it, it discovered or created, a, I think, a deceptive term because we're not unconscious. We have to be conscious, but we have two levels of consciousness, the subconscious and the awareness level. And I'm so aware of my subconscious and how it produces ideas on its own uh, and, um, and sometimes uh, uh, with the help of Google. I can't tell you how invaluable Google is as I do a lot of writing and I, I, I come across a, a phrase or a word or things like that. And I have a feeling of the significance and I so re easily re uh, rely upon Google to help me uh, understand the accuracy and, and, and I constantly do that. I'm writing a um, very extensive autobiography right now and, and, uh, and I spent so much time diverting from the uh, composing to check and, and validate and things like that. So um, I got the idea at one point, I don't know where, it, po it pops in my subconscious and, and it's so invaluable to to nurture it and to, to benefit from it. Uh, the idea about uh, experiencing art and uh, knowing how uh, the mind operates on coded discrete batches of electrochemical pulse signals that evolution exploited, um, that, uh, the, that we uh, experience everything that way in that functional way and um, I uh, have been involved with art. I made uh, sculpture for 20 years from found objects using the engineering aspect of my mind. And um, so I, I was moved to uh, write an article to uh, describe my uh, perceptions of the functional aspect of art. And what I found was so interesting, uh, I network well, believe me, it's wonderful. And you live here in a network, <laughs> I notice now. But um, in Canton, Mass, where I live, they have a wonderful uh, Canton Community TV system. And it's run by a very bright woman. And uh, in my networking activity, I live in a retirement community down in Canton. I took initiative to get in touch with her and um, she readily realized that uh, I apparently have a contribution to make in my ideas and my discussions. And uh, she, uh, when I gave her my idea on art, she brought up uh, uh, the fact that Leo Tolstoy, a famous Russian uh, author, had written uh, a, um, an article entitled, What is Art? And I, I had no idea about that. I mean, it, the, the networking is so invaluable for bringing out these resources. and. Uh, it became so interesting how his um, notice that art is simply the exercise of feeling, and uh, and I would define art as, as all activities that produce human feeling, which is so fundamental to human existence. And I found it fascinating to find his uh, Tolstoy's uh, abstract concept so parallel to my functional concept, and, and I, I wrote an article about the functional aspect of art with, with, his, with Tolstoy's ideas in the background. And uh, it, it turned out to be an, an absolutely beautiful uh, article. And um, recently, she and I had a conversation on t her TV and produced a half an hour program that is it, just exciting to, and it's, it's, it's so, um, I think, so 
perfect for non-scientists. I think that's the important uh, aspect of what I'm doing and thinking about, because I am a non-scientist. I can uh, assimilate and grasp uh, neuroscientist concepts, and I think that through the functional understanding of the human mind, it becomes more uh, possible to, to grasp what neuroscientists are discovering and describing. And um, so I, th I find that it's an ideal vehicle to reach and, and, and um, educate uh, non-scientists uh, from this basic uh, uh, approach. Now, I've talked about a half an hour now, and I would love it if, if I have stimulated and triggered things in your mind if you would respond, if you would validate what I say. I love validation, but also if you criticize, because I'm concerned that in my self-focus that I might be off the wall in some respects, which I would not want to do. So I will invite you people to, uh, to help me. Uh, I came here for the help, and, and, uh, and thank you. Okay. Um. Uh, computer scientists found great challenges trying to emulate certain ways that, that the human mind thinks. Yes. So there are obviously big differences. Yeah. Parallel right? processing, yeah. Well, um, neural networks, for example, to, trying to make the computers be able to do the sorts of things that humans yeah. can do. Oh, sure. It ends up being a great challenge. So obviously there are, there are gaps there. But one thing that, that you seem to have um, not touched on, I wonder whether you've Thank thought you. about this in depth, is the changing of the human mind as a result of working with computers. Um, all that I hear on this topic is people's cynicism. Nobody's going to be able to find his way around on, on the map anymore because they're using mapping computers. They can't uh, use a dictionary because the computer uh, uh, does that work for them. But um, uh, not going to the extent of actually coupling the mind with the computer. Um, have you thought about how people's thinking is changing as a result of the extension of your thought to here's the data I was looking for by doing a Google search, for example? Well, I, I think that computers are mostly significant for given, giving us this, this opening to the mind. Um, and uh, as, as, as aids, supplementary aids, they're great, but I think this, this opening up uh, is, is a wonderful contribution they make. And um, uh, what I find amazing is how little people who use computers really know how they work. And it, it's so simple. And I think that in my uh, missionary effort uh, that it could be a way to encourage people to learn more about, about computers. Uh, by the way, in thinking about this, I really recently uh, I love writing essays on these aspects of my general thinking. And recently, somehow, my subconscious triggered me to think about artificial intelligence. Ray Kurzweil, this great futurist guru here, has the solution. There are going to be computers that are superior to the mind, which I think is the silliest concept in the world. I think that, that in artificial intelligence, I think, is really only programming computers to do specific activities like play chess and things like that. But when you think about the human mind, it is not, while it is a, a controlling mechanism for the related human body as an encompassing machine or system, the two are, are so interrelated, they're inseparable. And to think of artificial intelligence as a separate mind, it, it's unreasonable. The mind needs a supporting body. And, and um, I can't quite picture an independent mind as a robot, pure robot, uh, tagging along with a, with a, uh, a cart. That's the body that, that forages for nutrition and, and operates as a chemical factory to support the mind and a power generator for creating the pulse signals. I mean, I, I, I think that it's so important to, to analyze the realities and not be taken up by these, these flashy uh, ideas. I, I think Ray is brilliant, but I think, I, I don't know if you agree with me, but I think he's off the wall because it just isn't realistic in, in, the, in the, the approach he's taking. Yeah? Uh, 
understanding that idea, part of what uh, he's proposing is that uh, that people will be able to move their minds into computers in some way, uh, and the various ways people think about how you get your mind out of your brain into a machine um, is interesting just to think about um, whether it's possible in any way conceivable, you know, projecting 100, 1,000 years, whatever it takes, will the computers ever be advanced enough to conceive of that as a possibility? I think the computers can only be supplements. And the human mind is so fundamental and so amazing that, uh, that I, I think that we're limited to using them to supplement the mind, which can be great. I mean, I do that in a sort of a primitive way. Uh, and I also uh, do that by inspiring me to think more deeply about the mind. I think that is the approach. I don't know if I'm right or not, but that, that seems to me to, to be what it's all about. Yeah. Um, using your model of studying a computer to learn about the mind uh, to some extent to answer this question, um, we have virtual machines. That is, a computer can run within it a number of things, each of which feels like it is an independent computer. Yeah. It's relatively easy when they think some way. It's easiest, of course, if the internal one thinks it's identical to the outer one, just yeah. smaller. Um, um, the more difference you get, the more you have to advance the the um, uh, the technology of making the computers, basically the, the software and the operating systems, yeah. in order to be able to simulate a different kind of processor chip or altogether different way of operating. For yeah. example, a virtual machine, um, which thinks like the human mind, presumably can't be built until you can have the fun the basic the base computer able to think like the yeah. human mind to some extent. So we would have to get computers, presumably, who can be, who, I just used the word Yeah, sure, who, which. Can be, uh, uh, who can be uh, uh, introspective, get uh, a concept of self. And then it's a lot of work beyond that to basically model the entire human body and mind as one. As you said, that the mind and the muscles are very linked. They're not separate mm -hmm. devices. Yeah. Um, detached from each other. And so y y you can imagine the number of years it might take to make a computer that, that can think like a person, if that's possible, double to get to the point where you can actually put a human's mind in it. I think, again, I, I feel so um, modest about this because I'm not a neuroscientist, but I think that the operation of the human mind devised by evolution, by natural selection, is so unique, is so elusive. I mean, the very details of coding facts and ideas in the electrochemical pulse signals uh, in the mind, uh, I, I, I find it difficult to imagine that people ever will be able to emulate that in computers, but that's my present thinking. But recently, I, was, uh, I noted in the newspaper, and I find invaluable reading the newspaper, especially the New York Times, a, uh, a c computer system uh, was uh, devised to replicate um, some medical a aspect, enables uh, doing research on the computer instead of directly on it would be on uh, animal models, uh, counterparts of the mind. And, but I, uh, that, that's a very fascinating development, but I, 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 just, I just find it hard to, uh, to really expect that, that neuroscientists can picture those individual pulse signals and, and, and how they work. But I also, I think it's fascinating when you have the computer model to realize how the circuitry of the mind is segmented and how, like in computers, it's, it, the segments are joined, they're assigned significance. And um, I found it fascinating and, and I was thinking and how um, the segments in computers are uh, connected by switches and the programs activate the switches to uh, conduct thinking, uh, the counterpart of thinking, the carrying out of processes. 
And it, it caused me to wonder, well, how is this in the mind? And then I thought about synapses, and synapses being the opposite of switches in that they're always open, and you have to find a way to jump them. Uh, and uh, I was able, uniquely, to meet uh, a professor at, uh, at MIT um, in the uh, McGovern Institute for Brain Research, who's supposed to be an expert on synapses. And he immediately helped me by saying, well, synapses operate by modulation. And I, I could, as an engineer and, and as sort of an amateur engineer, I realized what, what happens in programs is they generate <laughs> added impulse to cause, as appropriate, the, uh, the electrochemical um, pulse signals that represent facts and ideas into particular segments uh, of the mind in order to, uh, to conduct the type of thinking that's desired. So um, I, I'm just sort of trying to give you broadly an example of, of how um, I think having an engineering aptitude and a systems approach and getting this sort of superficial understanding that I have so enables uh, people to, to understand better who they are, how they work, and I would hope idealistically that if they gain this knowledge that, uh, that they can realize how they're being imposed upon by the inadequacy of the mind through ideology and, and the like and can be encouraged uh, to um, to overcome that by objective critical thinking using their creativity. I mean, this, yeah, I, I find this exciting, and I just wonder, does it resonate <laughs> with you people who are, are so much more uh, uh, aware of, of uh, the technology of computers and the potential? Go ahead, please. Uh, I've observed a lot of people um, adamant on sticking with their limitations, even when those limitations are oh, big yeah. enough for oh. them as the product of, of outside forces. Yeah. Um, their sense of self is tied up with it. And I think in this country, more than most others, we need to develop a culture that values thought more for people to do the thinking that would get them to decide that they don't want to just be stuck with what they were born with before. It's so idealistic, but so needed. But I don't think we we're worse than anybody else. I mean, people are so infected with ideologies, religious prejudices, bigotry. I mean, it, 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 it's human. And uh, it's so easy. When you have an ideology, you don't have to think. You've got the answers. I mean, it, it's such a, it's a curse. And, and I, I, I'm a missionary, <laughs> I have to admit it. And I, I just have this feeling that, um, Thinking along the lines that ha I have developed, uh, so I think so beautifully. I mean, I'm I'm thrilled. Uh, I I think it it it's it's a it's a, an ideal contribution for people to behave individually and society. And I just just wonder if some of these ideas are ideal means for education for teaching people to empower them uh, and not to be victims of uh, the traditional ideologies and mindsets and the like. I mean, I, I think it really enhances individuality and the persona and the like. And it's like painting a picture. I mean, it, it's, it, it's, um, I'm having <laughs> the most exciting experience I can imagine. And you know how old I am? I'm 95, <laughs> and I, I think it's so fascinating. How it, this happened, I have no idea, of course. People ask me for my secret. Who the hell has a secret? But I'm just thrilled that it, it happened this way. And um, in, in writing my autobiography, I, I look for clues. For example, uh, I look at my parents, who are very ordinary. My mother uh, came from uh, Vilna. Lithuania at 16 before the First World War. I have no idea what education she had. I was too interested in myself to find out. I'm so sorry about it. She was very open-minded, never was religious 
in a formal way, uh, which I am certainly not. And my father was uh, first generation here. His father came from Belarus because of the Kishinev pogroms there that caused the Jews to start leaving. And he was a very open-minded man. I think my mother was more intelligent than he was, but he was affable, friendly, and, and very decent. And he gave me a very open growing up, uh, 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 which I, I, pre I treasure. So in course of thinking and, and writing my autobiography, these facets sort of turn up, and, uh, and I, I think that uh, this is, to me, it, it's an ideal frame of reference to be a, a decent human being and work toward a better society. <laughs> you have any more questions? You're good. <laughs> uh, this is a question that sort of combines uh, your three areas of the law and the, and the, and the computers and the mic, uh, which is, uh, you mentioned the intellectual property. Um, <clears throat> uh, I believe that the um, at, at some point, the, the computer technology, uh, our, our ability to build intelligent software um, will advance to the point where we can write a general program which can create things in at least a, a domain of area. It's hard to be extremely broad, but be a, be a creative force for coming up with stuff that we recognize as being new and innovative, things that we previously had assumed only humans could do. So the question is, when do we acknowledge <laughs> That the, the software is really the owner, the creator of, of this new stuff, as opposed to us who may own the software. And it's going to be a long while after that where the computer might assert its own, the software might assert that it is the creator, but we at least acknowledge that we didn't do it. I think we're trying to, I don't know if I got exactly what you're driving at, but I think that. Uh, understanding the human mind as it's programmed by uh, its self-creation and by learning from the environment uh, is an ideal basis for working into the computer technology to realize it's so hard to um, fully understand it, but I think it, it, it's valuable to think in that context. Yes? Oh, I was just going to say, maybe your question is a little more like, at what point can we say that a computer has creativity, that this was a creative product of the computer and the, you know, itself as opposed to its you know, non-autonomous behavior because we pushed its button and so it created an output? Um, I wonder about the ability ever to make computers truly creative like the human mind. The ability of the subconscious to to combine disparate things is most amazing phenomenon to, to create something new from two different things. I mean, uh, uh, I wonder if people will ever be smart enough, but I don't know. Uh, it's curious. Yeah. One easy criterion to, to define, I think, well, relatively, is when a computer can either make itself better or make others that are better than it and doesn't hit a wall soon. It seems to be continuing in the, in the direction of improvement, then it has taken on something of a mind of its own that is no longer our creation. It's hard to apply that to other tasks. There have been airfoils created by computers decades ago, which nobody imagined would fly, but, but I, I think they, you know, uh, segment of surface by segment, they they tried different mutations, and oh, this way gets more lift, and they morphed it in the computer in many iterations to a shape that it turned out flew. But they had to be told how to do that. Right. Yeah. But even if even if it went to ways that they didn't explicitly need to be told, it's hard to make a criterion. But when it comes to making the computer better than humans have made a computer before, that's one where where you can. It, it isn't that we didn't go in that direction. Clearly, making the computer able to do computer improvement was a direction that we were striving for, and the computer outdid us. Yeah. Um, and if it can keep that up for a year of improvements, then clearly it has crossed the line. But that's heuristic, isn't it? Yeah. 
It is not the human mind equivalent, but it has crossed right. a line yeah. that, that clearly has made it create things that, that we were unable to. I think when we get at least, I'm, I'm sort of conservative about my ideas. I think they're great, but I'm never fully certain. But I think that the more we know about the mind, the more we understand the possibilities and limitations of computers. And I think that's the beauty of having this technology. Uh, is, is there has been some interesting work in computational simulation of neurons. I yeah. saw that article in like Scientific American or something. Yeah. You know. And I just wonder, like, suppose we have, uh, how many neurons do we have? 10 to the 15th or something in our, in our brains? Yeah. That, An awful lot. An awful lot. And so it takes, you know, such and such amount of computer power now to simulate one neuron. Is it, I mean, is it just a question of scale? Like, suppose we did build a computer big enough to simulate 10 to the 15th neurons. Would, do you think there might be a possibility for that ensemble to do the things that this wetware does? I have to be humble and say that's something for you to answer more than <laughs> I. That, uh, uh, I. I really have no idea, but uh, it, it's amazing what evolution and natural selection did. I mean, it's just unbelievable and, uh, and how it happened as responses to handicaps in, in living, how people overcame over long periods of time those handicaps and improved the physical structure of the mind. And, and by the way, this matter of knowledge, uh, what I find so interesting is the fact that acquiring knowledge is a, an acquired characteristic which is not passed on through reproduction. And that's why for each person they have to create their own unique body of knowledge and then it, it's passed on only through external means, books and recordings and things like that and, and recordings in minds. And also, in connection with my ideas about art, what I find fascinating is the analogy of the human mind as a sculpture. I think it's fascinating that, that it it's constantly, it's plastic and constantly shaped by the acquisition of or creation of knowledge. And that is, that represents pastons to this physical structure within the skull that in turn determine emotions and action. And I, I think that it, it's just the most fascinating thing to think that how we are sculptures and sculptors at the same time. And, and I, I, I love to draw these analogies to uh, realize and, and to in various fields, I mean, in terms of art and, and the like. Yes? <laughs> so you say that uh, you, you appreciate how, how, how biology, through biology, we've, we've evolved um, the, the intelligence that we have, the mind is a product of that evolution. Um, uh, and the question of how machines might do it, I believe it probably has to involve a similar kind of evolution because probably we don't understand what it is that makes up how we operate. Even if we did understand it, it would be very actually difficult to build explicitly, do it like we do it, I think. Uh, so modeling the, the brain is probably not the right way to do it uh, directly. It's more about its functionality. And I think that there might be a lot of uh, sort of, um, evolutionary kind of principles going on in the brain itself as thinking process is kind of a natural selection of ideas you know, whatever your, the dominant ideas yeah. are that uh, you kind of reinforce by your self-awareness is, yeah. is, is how, how it works so I, I saw as to whether you could actually build machines that would actually be as intelligent as us be possibly if we acknowledge it self-aware as we are I think it has to happen by way of evolution yeah. What I find fascinating is that the two men who invented the ENIAC computer uh, had, could not have had any idea of how the mind works. It was well before neuroscientists had uh, realized the uh, existence of circuitry and the uh, pulse signals in, in the mind. And so they drew on knowledge of physics and, uh, and, and systems engineering, things like that. And, uh, and yet um, their minds 
triggered some. I also, in looking at the history of interest in computing, which goes way back uh, and, and through so many mechanical efforts, it seemed to me that the creation of an electronic digital computer was inevitable. Uh, it, 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 we were working toward that path over many, many years, and so much uh, of the need was for the uh, commercialization of electricity made possible by uh, Thomas Alva Edison, which was just such a, a boost to, to that. It's fascinating to take this whole goddamn picture and, and put it together. It, 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 it's just fascinating. And, Exciting just in itself. Thank you so much for this ability and opportunity to <laughs> expatiate. And um, if I've stimulated curiosity, desire to talk again, I would love it. I, I, I just, to me, this is my value in living. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>